Hello, everyone. My name is Emmeline Wong, and I came here from the US. I live in Texas, where it's very hot, so it's very refreshing to be here in Finland. Today, I'm going to be talking about API and platform strategies. So pretend that you've hiked to the top of your favorite mountain, and you're looking out over the API landscape. So it's this very macro view about the API uh, landscape, and then we'll go also into details uh, when we talk about developer experience. So I thought about this. Um, when you go to a new culture, you should really learn about the language. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun to have a finish my name API? And no one has built this yet, but there are a lot of generators. And so, you know, pretend if, if I became a, a Finnish citizen, this is me. In reality, this is my name and where I'm from. I was flying Finn Air from Texas and opened the Blue Wings magazine, and the CEO talks about how uh, Finn Air, the business of, of safety and service, is all about sense and sensibility. And it really made me think about how that's how we should be running um, API programs that you need to think about the entire experience, digital and human. And so I thought that uh, this statement that he had was very uh, befitting. So this particular statement, I'll break it down because I know it's kind of long, but it's basically my way of wrapping my thoughts around, okay, how do you connect APIs and platform and economy and landscape? And to me, it's all about, okay, how do you balance agile time to market with the ability to tackle, for example, things like technical debt? And I'll come back to that slide um, um, if you'd like. So this is kind of how I break it down. So this is kind of how the world is working today. We have some API projects where we can get some funding, which then become API programs. And then multiple APIs can string together on multiple clouds to become platforms. Then you can connect different platforms together using APIs to build an economy. Uh, and that economy consists of many different ecosystems. And as many of you know, it's not just the digital that's making these ecosystems work. In fact, I did fly my mom here, and she flew here on the Norwegian airline. So we were kind of uh, comparing experience of airlines. And it's also been fun because she's never been to an API conference or, or here in Finland. And so the reason why that's important is I think about um, my mom and her generation and, and what the, the digital space means to them. So let's break down that statement that I had mentioned before, the control and flow patterns of data. So there are many people here, we'll dive in the, to the technical parts of this um, in the workshop that's actually right after this, 1125. Uh, so these patterns are really important. So this conference is 30% C-level, 30% practitioners, product owners, et cetera, and 30% developers. And so data is going to be different to, um, to each level that it is um, interacting uh, with this economy. So I basically put friction points. What, when you think of the end user and the data, you think of friction points. I'm frustrated when my data is locked within a, a device or a platform. And so that's how you might think about um, um, data. And then it's the control and flow pattern of functionality. And in this, I mean the agile development. And so as, as many of you know, there's the API ops methodology that Maryuka will talk about later. And in that particular scenario, it's all about, OK, so I've just, for example, in Texas experienced a natural disaster, and I want to use the insurance app to make a claim. But depending on the performance of the API, I may or may not get through the filing of this insurance claim. I'm sure there's not this problem here in Finland where it's all very smooth. And then it's also the control and flow patterns of resources. And by resources, I'm not talking about the API resource or URI, URI or URL. I'm talking about people funding and the wonderful speakers before me you know, covered that in detail. And so in this way, I'm, I'm putting myself in the shoes of the API product owner or the head of engineering and thinking, I need to compete in this API economy. Uh, I need to modernize my SOAP APIs. How do I hire the kind of talent to do what I want to do? 
And so we're back to this slide again. I think that the secret to winning in this API landscape is actually treating the API as a product. Um, when you treat the API as a product, you're now able to get the kind of funding and justification that you need to create a great program. And so some of the fundamental questions that product leaders in engineering are asking are ones where they actually have to work together because there are dependencies uh, so that they can be successful um, when it comes to, for example, key performance indicators. So I literally am putting myself in their shoes and have actually um, worked in R&D for 15 years and then also worked as a, a technical marketing leader and, um, and was actually in those shoes. So building and consuming APIs. And so here's a, a really fun scenario. So to me, it's all about getting your stakeholders to play with the API and to discover the value. And how do you do that? And so what I always ask businesses to do and what I've done as an API product owner is you show the experience and that audience can, will resonate with that and then you also show the technical experience behind that. So on the left, you have a simulation of an iPad. And on the right, it's actually the technical back end doing it. So it's actually a virtual assistant. And I'm talking to it. And I'm saying, OK, so I'd really like to know how much have I spent this month? And the virtual assistant replies. And it showed this isn't actually really my spending, but it's a credit card spending, right? So it's saying, OK, and this is in uh, Singapore dollars. And, and this demo is actually courtesy of my uh, German colleague who's based in Singapore. And on the right side, it's actually using our technology stack, the Axway stack, where um, it's running the API calls. And I then the virtual assistant says, OK, let me suggest some loans for you. And it gives me three options. And what's important about this is, I think with developers, the UI doesn't speak as much as when you peek under the hood and you say, what's going on? You know, how is the security? How is the throttling? Um, OK, I see that you've got the business value on the left. But what I really care about is that this particular uh, voice assistant is always performing as expected. And on the right side, if you create an API where the experience is easier to learn, then developers can get onboarded quickly. Third party developers um, can learn it quickly. And so I truly believe that it's all about um, understanding and showing the audience what they need in the API experience to help justify what they should be building. So you can see this automatically pops up, you know, the application for the loan and, um, and it's branded. And, and so this, this kind of, you play with the API, you show the experience, that's actually how you can get buy-in from a stakeholder standpoint. So I read uh, Mariuka and the many authors here uh, in Finland who wrote API Economy 101. Uh, the book was originally written in Finnish, and I thought it was amazing that you had this glossary that defines terms um, in Finnish, and it has business use cases and technical use cases that make sense for this market. But then the English translation was spectacular. Uh, I know I'm going to use the book in my everyday practice, and to me that's exciting because not every industry should be digitized in the same way. And so I want to talk about network effects. And I'm only going to cover two out of the five different network effect strategies to basically build a platform that is resilient in this API economy. So the first one is, OK, so say I uh, go to a platform that's driven by APIs to, for example, find someone to, um, to provide a service, right? Uh, run an error under a task. Um, but then what's going to incentivize you to stay on the platform to use that person again in the future? Maybe it's payments. Well, when you can't capture that relationship, say you can connect with them offline, then you lose the value on that platform. So that's disintermediation. Same thing with multi-homing. So it's really cheap for us to use different um, services, at least at home. We can use many different kinds of services, Uber, Lyft. It's really ex inexpensive, right? I just download the app and I can use it. So what helps you keep people on your platform? 
And so I'd like to tell the story. So you've got your uh, Swedish neighbor, right? They created Spotify, and they're doing so well. And um, one of our customers, SiriusXM, um, purchased Pandora um, to try to compete against what Spotify is doing. And so they did this by uh, offering this 360-degree listening experience. And so this is what I foresee as their platform strategy. So this is the whole thing. However, these are the pieces that are API-driven. And I'll actually dive deeper into this. So you've got platform strategy, which is a little bit of everything. API strategy, you go in deeper. And then now let's go in uh, and talk about each column. OK. So SiriusXM used to just be in automotive infotainment. And you could only have it updated uh, you know, very infrequently. It's satellite radio, right? That's what they're known for. Then now all, all of a sudden you have streaming music and mobile apps and tablets. And they're trying to capitalize on that. And so what they did was they basically made a modern way of a human and um, IoT devices so you can listen to it in your car, um, at home, and on and various devices. And they offer exclusive content with you know, partnerships, et cetera. Uh, Spotify is doing the same thing. I was looking at the news feed this morning, and you know they're kind of fighting back, right? And same thing with um, operating systems. So they're working with many different car manufacturers and radio stations, just constantly trying to get this content that will appeal to many audiences. And so as you can see, subscription packages, if you're a developer, you're thinking, OK, right, uh, rate limiting. And you're thinking about ways uh, in, in an, uh, you're thinking about, for example, not request response APIs, but event driven APIs when it comes to streaming. Um, and so feel free when the slides are available for you to dig deeper into this, uh, this use case. And so this is my own theory, that friction is not necessarily bad. Because that friction, if it's enough for someone to either stay on your platform or to stay off of other platforms, you've actually generated a kind of value. And I'll tie that in with how um, developers can, uh, can uh, take this um, kind of concept. So um, software architects are always negotiating constraints. And the reason why this is important is pretend you have a CEO that uh, you know, they, they don't really care that much about technology. They only care about revenue gains or value to, to shareholders. And that's where it's important to understand the different kinds of software architectures, uh, what they do. Um, this is kind of the you know, holy grail, Mark Richards and Neil Ford. Uh, they teach a really great course on O'Reilly where, so the business really cares about cost, maybe scalability and performance, um, yes, IT cares about it too, and what's really different is you're constantly negotiating between, okay, the business might see the architecture as a cost center, yet it's also the only way that you can innovate. And you can't just, okay, wouldn't it be nice if you could just take the best aspects? I'll go back because it looks like a lot of people want to see that slide. So as, as most of you know, space-based, that's going to be the fastest performance, but it's the most cost. You can't just take the best parts of the architecture and put it together. I mean, you kind of can. So now, obviously, with hybrid integration, you have multiple clouds and multiple API gateways and multiple types of architecture. So that's one way. But the reason I mention this is microservice architecture is popular, and REST-based services are popular, and everyone wants to do microservices. But Mark Richards says that's actually one of the most difficult architectures to implement. And because of that complexity, even though it offers the most modularity and scalability, we somehow have to justify to the business how we keep this architecture. <laughs> And so again, I was going to mention how business and technology can get together. So again, I mentioned this 360-degree uh, listening experience. This is the overall experience that SiriusXM is trying to deliver. And to me, I thought that was you know, so much fun. Almost to every device and every car, now it's going to you know, come with some of your favorite apps. And that's great, for example, when my mom is in her car, she doesn't have to think about downloading something that's already there. Uh, I mentioned friction. 
So if you look at Pandora's developer portal, it's vetted for certain developers. Whereas you look at Spotify, right, they're kind of leading at the moment. It's very open, right? It talks about community. Um, it really wants you, it's got, you know, developer libraries. It's got great reference documentation. They really want you to enter, uh, 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 sorry, engage with, with that platform. And with Pandora, I think they're trying to formulate uh, more of a community. But it was worth $3.5 billion, that community. And so this value is important because you can see that this platform extends beyond um, hardware. And so now I want to talk a little bit about my experience. Um, I worked in authorized distribution, and the reason why that's important is almost anyone in authorized distribution, this can be anything from retail to electronic components, are all very afraid of carriers that are not um, authorized distributors. And one of the ways they can combat, for example, the Amazon effect is relationships with suppliers and manufacturers. So there's a nonprofit called 10,000 Villages, and that nonprofit actually has had uh, relationships with uh, fair trade groups um, for generations. And they're very, a very sustainable nonprofit. And so they're able to really offer um, that kind of value by having the relationships. And then the last part of the presentation is all about developer experience. So uh, my background is in technical communication. And time and again, we see that in addition to the spec, you need to have great documentation. And so the specification is often the toughest piece to find. So for example, you want to try an API, you want to use the spec, and it's hard to find it, right? You look at it on a search engine, and you can't find the spec. And what many companies don't realize is the spec is truly the core. Um, the founder of the Async API specification is here um, from Spain, and he'll be speaking later. And I'm involved in that community because I believe just as the open API spec is mature and there's tooling and there's a community, and so we need to build that up for um, asynchronous APIs, and I encourage you to join. And so this is actually a, a tiny snippet of doc, and I have three pages of links where you can get access to all the resources where I'm describing to developers, okay, if you want these code snippets, these are all the different ways and the flavors where you can get your code snippets. And the same thing, I give them contextual cues in the reference. And this is important because you only have one shot at reaching developers. I believe the mind share, there's so many things competing for developers today that adoption is only done if it's seamless. And the other part that's important is because you have the core um, spec, you have to be able to easily translate it into the technical spec that you need so that you can design the API in a way that matches um, the business stakeholders. And so this is um, APMatic. It's basically a free translator, and they support everything from RAML, Postman Collection, Swagger, um, SOAP, and you can translate them or transform them into the kind of spec format that you want, and then every year they actually uh, publish the statistics globally of which specs are the most popular and where they're being transformed, um, but of course any personal uh, data is, is removed. And so more communities, so I'm part of the Women Who Code uh, global community and I'm involved locally. And that has been a great resource for me and has really um, supported me. And so I'm constantly trying to give back to that community. And then t uh, Tim Falls, uh, he works for SendGrid. He mentioned this, and I don't know how, um, and I hope this conversation will go on, uh, how, the, how the culture here thinks about this, but that this handshake is truly worth more than a click that when you build these relationships, so there's this um, hashtag, it's called DevRel, and it's all about, I try to explain, for example, to traditional marketing that for developers, it's not transactional. It's all about that uh, genuine relationship that you're developing with each other as you solve um, technical problems. And then Matthew Revel, he runs Hoopio, which is a consultancy in the UK. He talks about, this is very important, several speakers covered this in their talks, that the reason why the technology is so important 
is because as a tech leader, your career and your reputation depends on the performance of your technology. So you choose the technology for fit and function, but it also personally builds you up. So, so Scala developer might uh, be different than a JavaScript developer versus a, um, a Python developer. And they think differently, and, uh, and the communities run slightly differently, but they know that their, their reputation is at stake when they use um, a particular kind of technology. And so the last part of the presentation is, is basically going back to the beginning, where sense and sensibility. Um, the details are very important in API. The business results are very important. But I think the CEO of Finair really got it right when he said it's all about this logical and emotional delivery of the API. Uh, and so th these are my key points. Um, basically, platform strategy, right? So it's very high level when you're designing your API. You need to think about how to incentivize people to stay on your platform, incentivize people to use an API that they believe is stable, that they can uh, wrap their businesses around, and that it's all about that culture. And when you're choosing that technology, when you're choosing um, what to use, it's understanding the culture around that technology that's going to make you um, successful as well. So the rest of the deck are resources for you to take home. Um, I've quoted you know, quite a few uh, people around the world, including locally, and I hope that you'll go to those resources and take them into your practice and uh, continue this conversation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Emily.